Well, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to worship this morning. And as we sing and pray and uh, learn together, it's our hope and prayer that we feel God's presence here in our midst. Uh, not many announcements on this uh, warm summer Sunday. Uh, just a reminder uh, that we're continuing with Sundays on Tuesday at Knox. And so if you'd like to come, it's this coming Tuesday and then the following Tuesday. We've had a good crowd of people. We worship for about 20 minutes to a half an hour. Uh, and there's no sermon. Maybe that will attract more. Uh, but it's a family-friendly service, and it's been a, a great opportunity for some of our young families from the church to still connect with worship uh, during the busy summer months for them. All are welcome. I think the youngest last Sunday was about two or three, and the oldest was, I'd like to say, about 86. So uh, everyone's welcome, and then we always finish with Shaw's ice cream. So uh, if you'd like to join us, it's this Tuesday at 6.30 and use the Mitchell Street uh, entrance. Many of you know uh, that uh, a few years ago, I was supposed to be here in August, and I ended up uh, spending a few months at home battling breast cancer and uh, going through chemotherapy. What you might not know is my very first Sunday back at church, the very first Sunday that I was well enough to be able to come and worship at Knox, uh, was a Sunday in November. I had finished chemotherapy and I was going through radiation. And uh, any of us who've gone through any kind of a treatment or a health crisis like that know uh, what it feels like when you're finally allowed out again and you finally feel a little bit free that you can come uh, back and be with people. And on that Sunday, uh, a, a colleague of mine was preaching the service, but we sang uh, one of my favorite hymns. He had selected it not knowing I would be there that Sunday. It was Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, uh, which is our opening hymn. And what struck me as we all stood and sang that hymn together, there's a line in that hymn. Uh, we are victors in the midst of strife. And uh, now whenever I sing, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, I think about that line, no matter what uh, we're struggling with, uh, as people of faith, we are victors in the midst of strife. Our call to worship today uh, are the, is the words from Henry Van Dyke, and he was the man who wrote joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And he wrote it with the intention of putting it to Beethoven's Ode to Joy, uh, which is the tune we sing it to. And he wrote it uh, while he was visiting at a friend's home. He was the guest preacher at a, at a church, and he was visiting uh, and staying with his friend. And he reflected on, on the words that had just sort of come to him. And he said, these verses are simple expressions common Christian feelings and desires. These are hymns, this is a hymn of today that may be sung together by people who know the thought of the age and are not afraid that any truth of science will destroy religion or any revolution on earth overthrow the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, says Henry Van Dyke, this is a hymn of trust and of joy and of hope. So we open our worship singing together, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, hymn number 90 in our books of praise.
seated. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, you are greater than the most powerful forces in this world. And we pray that today, just for this hour, you might enable us to be still and know that you are God. Lord, speak to us in the silence of worship. Speak to us in the songs we sing and in the words we hear. Speak to us and also give us words to speak to you. Living God, open our hearts this morning and bless us as we set aside this time to remember who we are as followers of Jesus. For we ask all of this in the name of Christ who taught us when we pray together to also say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our youth hymn is printed today on uh, the pink sheet uh, that's included in your bulletin. Well, I, I did see one young fella way at the back. Is he feeling um, like too comfortable to come up? And it's okay if he is, if he wants to color at the back instead. We'll see. Well, he's being coaxed up. It's worth your while. <laughs> it's worth your while to come to the front. You'll see why. We'll put these here out of temptation's way. Well, last week, all this month, we're talking about traveling. Have you ever traveled? I don't know your name yet. What's your name? Derek. Nice to meet you, Derek. I'm Mavis. So we're, have, did you go on any trips this summer at all, Derek? No trips at all. Well, all, oh, there's a B. 
I'm going to say that just because so everybody knows that you're not just you're not becoming Pentecostal. You're just there's bees around. <laughs> Or may, better be careful about that in a Baptist church. <laughs> anyway, today we're talking about traveling, and today we're going to talk about learning the language of the people that we're traveling with. And uh, I thought I'd tell a story. Last week we did, we talked about parables. And a parable was a story that Jesus told that wasn't true, but it helped people to learn things about how they lived. So today I thought I might tell a story, a parable, about words and how important our words are. So this story, Derek, is about a woman who lived on a farm. Have you ever been to a farm? She lived on a farm and there were, what kind of animals might you find on a farm? Pigs, you might find pigs, yep, what else? Cows, great answer, yep, anything else? chickens yes so she had all of those animals on her farm and she she lived on the farm but she would go to town and there was a lady in town that sort of bugged her sort of bothered her have you ever had anybody bother you never oh you're so lucky well i have i have had people that just you know you can't quite but they just sort of bug you and so she started, you never bug me, Lucas. You are not one of the ones that bug me. Anyway, he, this, this woman, she didn't like this other woman, and so she started to talk about this woman. Everyone she went to, she said, you know, I don't like her very much. And, and she talks too much. And, I, you know, I saw her, she, was, she wasn't dressed appropriately when I, and, on and on she went, she told all of these people about this woman, so that no one, everyone began to think that the other woman was not very nice. Then the woman who lived on the farm realized that she had misjudged the other woman. She had been telling things about this woman that weren't true. In fact, the first woman had gone through something terrible in her life, which had made her a little more difficult to deal with. So the woman who lived on the farm, she was like us. She was a church person, a person of faith. So she went and talked to her minister. And she said, I have said things I shouldn't say. I would like to be able to take all of those words back about her. And the minister was an old man, and he had a long beard, and he stroked it. And he said, go back to your farm. Pluck a chicken. Now, I didn't have any chicken feathers, but I do have all of these colored feathers. And you can start, they're already starting to blow around. So you have to imagine these are chicken feathers, which would look more like that, right? Do you want to hold that one? So she took a big, huge bag of chicken feathers. She followed the minister's advice exactly. And he said to her, Wait, I want you to come back and see me after you have this big bag of chicken feathers and all the way, all the way to the village when you're going to come to see me at the church, I want you to drop the feathers. I want all of those feathers to be dropped on the way to come and see me. So this is what she did. She dropped a feather, and she kept walking, and she dropped another feather, and she kept walking. A huge bag, you have to imagine a huge bag of feathers all the way to the village, all the way there. And when she got there, she sat down with her minister, and she said, so I've done exactly as you've told me. Tell me now, how do I take back those words that I said about her? And the minister said, go back and pick up every one of the feathers you've dropped. That's how hard it is to take back our words. Because once we say them, they blow like the wind and go on to other places and other people. So that minister said, be really careful what you say in the future, because it's hard to take things back. So it's usually I say if you're under 12 and you come to church in the summer, because we don't have Sunday school, that I think you need extra nourishment 
to get to the end of the service, and I was trying to find candies that were shaped like feathers, but they don't exist, or I haven't been able to find them. But I did find some Cadbury eggs. So maybe that will help us all as we watch Derek enjoy his eggs at the back. Remember the story about the words we say being like the feathers of a chicken. Lucas, will you lead us in prayer? Hey, it actually, it actually uh, reaches to this. Yeah, so you say, let us pray. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the love of you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for people that have come to hear the word of you today. We pray now for the people in hospital. We pray for them because we know you will save them. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's sing together the last verse of our children's hymn uh, on the pink sheet in our book. confession today was composed uh, by a worship leader from Wales and his words are, are simple but I think while they were written across the ocean uh, they're words that that are also our words today so let's join together in prayer let us pray healing God we gather bringing prayers and needing prayers Lord, forgive us for the things we have done and for the things we have not done. Lord, forgive us for the things we have said and for the things we have not said. Lord, forgive us for the lives we have lived and for the lives we have not lived. Bless us today so that we might reflect the image of the one we profess to follow in thought and in word and in deed and in discovering our true selves, draw others into that light. For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the good news of our faith. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our responsive reading this morning is based on the New Testament letter to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 to 15, and you can find it uh, on the white insert in your bulletins. Our reader is Wendy Thompson. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on these attributes. Bear with one another. Be 
As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. Amen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I'd like to thank Estel. Estel Brown is a member of uh, uh, Knox and sings in the Knox Choir, and we're uh, grateful for your ministry today, Estel. 
I also, I think, neglected to introduce Martin Onderla, who is the Whoa. new organist at Knox, and many of the Knox folk here have met Martin and know him, but uh, to introduce him to our Baptist friends. Martin, we're glad to have you back with us today. Well, we've been walking through the Old Testament book of Proverbs uh, this month, and if you were here earlier, you'd know that Proverbs was written by King Solomon and some other wise, ancient leaders of the faith. And they wrote these pithy little instructions to God's people. And then those ones that were valued were put together and passed on to their children and to their children's children, passed on from generation to generation all the way down to us, here today in St. Thomas. And so this morning we're going to read Proverbs chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 20. Let's listen for God's word to us. My child, pay attention to what I say. Bend your ears to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them, and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all of your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, may this message be in the name of the Father and for the sake of the Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, any of you who know me, you know that I am the kind of person that GPSs were invented for. <laughs> Just ask my husband. <laughs> I have a terrible sense of direction. And so this past year, when our 10-year-old Honda Civic, finally we decided to pass it along to our oldest daughter, Tom and I went car shopping, and the number one feature, at least on my list for a new car, was a good GPS built right into the system. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have had that experience of, of punching in an address to the GPS, but I use mine daily. I, I don't know if you have a GPS, if you've ever, ever had the experience of punching in the address that you're going to and then in your head deciding that you want to make a small detour on your way there. If you have, you will know why I have learned to turn off the voice of the GPS in my car. I will give you an example for those of you who don't have one. I punch home into my car's GPS and that calm, dignified woman's voice, I call her Lois, because I hear her so regularly, she tells me, turn left in 1.5 kilometers. But then I decide to turn right, because I'm feeling a bit tired, and I'd like a cup of coffee from Tim Hortons. And Lois says, recalculating. And then as I pull into the, into the drive through of the Tim Hortons, she says, turn left in 25 meters. And I stop to give my order, and Lois says, recalculating. <laughs> recalculating, I can almost hear the frustration in Lois's voice. 
Today's reading from Proverbs begins with a pretty direct instruction. Do you remember how today's lesson began? Pay attention to what I say. That's the beginning of our reading this morning. Pay attention to what I say. Bend your ears to my words. I'll tell you, that's a phrase that we find repeated over and over again in the book of Proverbs. Pay attention, bend your ear, like Lois, determined to give us instruction. I'm wondering if those wise leaders who wrote Proverbs, I'm wondering if they realized how easy it is for us not to pay attention. I'm wondering if that's why they repeat that phrase over and over again in Proverbs. I I wonder if they knew it's easy for us to bend our ears to other things. It's easy for us to miss hearing the voice of God in our lives. Pay attention. Well, this week I had dinner with a colleague. He's getting close to retirement now. And he was reflecting on his years of ministry over dinner, the weddings and the funerals and the various congregations in which he served over the course of his career. Years ago, he was the minister at a three-point charge, three little churches out in the country. And like many congregations, those three on their own each had dwindled. And the minister at that point in his career, he was exhausted. He was preaching three times every Sunday, running three sets of meetings at each of those three different congregations. And each of the churches was struggling to make ends meet. And so a series of meetings were held, and after much prayer and much discussion, it was decided that the three little churches would join together into one congregation. Now there were dissenters, of course, but in the end, the leaders of the church, the elders of those congregations, they voted in favor of an amalgamation. And as I talked to this almost retired pastor, he scratched his head and he remembered all of those meetings and all of those conversations. And he said again, it was exhausting for me. I was absolutely drained. I was ready to quit. And at an evening service, the amalgamation of these three congregations was recognized. The minister of the churches, he said he stood at the front of the one sanctuary and he looked out at the people from his three different churches together. And he had arranged for the clerks of session. And for the Baptists among us, that's sort of the lead elder within the church. He had arranged for the clerks of session of each of his three congregations to come and stand at the front with him. And he had arranged that evening for a single Christ candle to be lighted on the communion table. And he had designed a liturgy so that he would light his candle from the Christ candle and then light the candle of each of the three elders. And then they would go on to light the rest of the elders' candles who would then go out into the congregation So the entire congregation would be holding a lighted candle. And he thought this will be a moving symbol for each of our different congregations, a reminder that though we're from different places, we are all one in Christ. We all carry the same light. But there was a problem. Just as he lit his own candle, he realized he had miscalculated. 
he had only laid two other candles at the front. And he had three clerks of session. And so knowing that there would be some hard feelings, knowing that he couldn't possibly slight one of these elders or the people of their congregation, he quietly handed his own candle off to one of the elders. And he said at the very end of the congregation, a photo was taken of the entirely, of the, this newly amalgamated congregation, all of them gathered holding their candles, and he said he just faked it. He just held up his hand like this, and he figured no one would notice that he didn't have a candle in the sea of flame. No one did notice. The service ended, and the gathered folk all went home. And that minister, he said, I was running on empty that night, and I took the next day off. And he said, my kids were, as usual, running late for the school bus, so I raced them in my van to the school bus stop. And we made it there, as we usually did, just in time. The kids scrambled out, and he said, I just sat there in my finally quiet van, and I put my head on the steering wheel. He said, I was just emotionally drained from the months of meetings and the difficult conversations, and to be honest, I was contemplating quitting. And he said, just at that moment, there was a little rap on the window of his van, another parent at the bus stop. Her kids sometimes came to his youth group. That woman, she never came to his church, any of the churches. And she had not been at the previous evening service. He didn't even know her name. But she rapped on his window and she held up a gift bag. For him. A small token, she said, to thank him for all she'd done, he'd done for her kids. And then she drove away. And that weary minister, he said, he took out the tissue paper in the gift bag. And of all the things she might have given him, on all the mornings she might have chosen to bring it, it happened on this morning, the morning after that amalgamation service, the morning when his faith and his passion, they were almost extinguished. And what was the gift inside the bag? It was a candle. Pay attention, Scripture tells us. No words might have been spoken, but surely that was the language of our faith. You and I, we worship a God who speaks not just in Old Testament Hebrew, but in our language. We worship a God who has something to say to each of us something unique for each of our own journeys through life. And I would submit to you, it's so easy to turn off the switch and to just not pay attention to the message that God is sending our way. It, it's easy for us to forget that God usually doesn't speak in thunderclaps. but in small gestures on ordinary mornings. When I was off on sick leave a few years ago, one of the things that I appreciated most was the newsy emails that members of Knox often sent me. Women telling me that they'd made 200 jars of jam in the church kitchen that morning for the church bazaar. 
or funny stories about the minister, my colleague who was filling in his brightly colored sock collection. And I, I remember an email from one of our Sunday school teachers. It was about her lesson on that particular Sunday to a group of grade two students in the Knox Sunday School. She wrote, we talked today in Sunday school about the voice of God. She said there was a healthy discussion about what God's voice might sound like by the grade twos. And then she said one of the little girls said, well, I imagine God's voice sounds a lot like ours. I'll tell you, I've thought about that grade two wisdom a lot. God's voice sounds a lot like ours. Throughout the book of Proverbs, in today's scripture and in many other verses, we are charged to remember the power of our words. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips, is the way it's put in today's reading. Proverbs 12, 18, we read, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Or Proverbs 18, 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those are just a few examples. When you and I bear this name called Christian, God is inviting us to be his voice in our corner of the world. So how we use our voices, our words, that matters. So this week I think we're invited to listen. To listen for the voice of God in our lives, speaking a language that is sometimes even too deep for words. And I think we are being pushed to think about how we speak. To remember the wisdom of that grade two Sunday school class. Because to those people who are not here this morning, the voice of God probably sounds a lot like ours. This week, we are invited to listen. And this week, we are invited to think carefully about the words we speak. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks that you are a God of mystery who comes to us and speaks to us in surprising ways and through surprising people. And we pray, O oh God, that we might be open to your spirit at work in our lives so that others might hear the voice of Christ in our words. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I've scattered a few feathers around, and I know we've talked about chickens, so I thought I'd tell you a little story about a duck this morning. A woman brought a very limp duck to the vet vet, and as she laid her pet duck out on the table, the vet pulled out his stethoscope, and he listened for the bird's heart. And after a moment or two, he shook his head. I'm sorry, your duck has passed away. And the distressed woman, she said, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure your duck is dead, the veterinary, veterinary vet said. Well, how can you be so sure, she protested. I mean, you haven't done any testing on him. He might be in a coma or something. And the vet, he rolled his eyes and he turned around and left the room and he returned a few minutes later with a black Labrador retriever. The duck's owner looked in amazement the dog stood on his back hind legs, put his front paws on the examination table, sniffed the duck from top to bottom, and then he looked up at the, dog, uh, at the veterinarian with sad eyes and he shook his head. And the vet, he patted the dog on the head and he took him out of the room. 
And a few minutes later, he returned with a cat. And the cat jumped on the table and also delicately sniffed the bird from head to foot. And then the cat stood on its haunches and shook its head. And then it strolled, as cats do, out of the room. And the vet looked at the woman and he said, I'm sorry, but as I said, most definitely, 100% sure, this is a dead duck. And then the vet turned to his computer terminal, hit a few keys and produced a bill and handed it to the woman. And the duck's owner stood in shock, $150. The vet shrugged. He said, I'm sorry. If you had just taken my word for it, it would have been $20. But with the lab report and the CAT scan, <laughs> it's now $150. <laughs> the Lord loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> the offering will now be received. Let us pray. Lord God, we bring these offerings a portion of what we have earned, and we dedicate them for your work in our churches and in this community and in our world. Bless each giver and each gift today, for we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Living God, you spoke and light shattered darkness. And so here in this sanctuary, as people of faith, 
we in confidence bring to you places of darkness in our world, places that need your word of hope and healing. Lord, we hold up to you those today who are afraid. We pray for those who are awaiting test results. We bring to you those who are worried about money. We hold up to you all who live in homes where there is violence or addiction. We pray for those who are afraid because of war or natural disaster. This morning, O oh God, we particularly pray for the people of British Columbia in the midst of battling so many wildfires. We pray for firefighters and for volunteers and for all who have been displaced. Lord God, we know you long for a world where there is no suffering. Help us to be your means of spreading healing and hope in the world. For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Our closing in hymn is Here I Am, Lord, number 589.
Now let us go in peace and may the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with each of you and all whom you love this day and forevermore.